I thank Kim Rice and the whole team at Exelon um, for the incredible work that they do. This partnership in so many ways is above and beyond. Um, so thank you to Exelon for hosting us. Mia, take it away. Thank you. Um, my name is Mia Valdez Qualvars. I'm the director of teacher programs at WITS, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about my friend Jessica. This is Jessica Uzo. She is a behavior and learning specialist. She uh, has a degree in something <laughs> in curriculum and um, child development from Michigan University. Michigan State. Michigan State. Go hey, I thought I had memorized this. I did not. I'm sorry. Uh, Jessica's wonderful. She splits her time between being a special education teacher at Northfield Primary Elementary School in Rogers Park and then also coaching study groups through Rolada. She's got many years of experience and she is also a yogi and a, quite an interesting character. I'm really excited for you guys to get to learn um, from her today. One more housekeeping tip, if you are not somebody from Exelon, there are bathrooms both all the way in the very back down the hall in this way, down the hall, that way. So please use the restroom. Lunches are in the back. And uh, take it away, Jessica. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I just want to make a quick note about some of the books that are in front of you, too. We tried to strategically organize so that um, we had our K through two primary earlier readers kind of on this side of things. And then over here, we had maybe our, our older kids, um, our harder readers. So. As you're eating and as I'm talking about different texts and about um, different questioning and discussion techniques that you can be using with your readers, please pick those books up. Um, please look at them with me while I'm talking about them. 80% uh, of people are visual learners, um, and I'm definitely going to give you a few visuals here, and I'm going to give you some auditory here, but I really want you to also put your hands on those books, open those books, take a look at the text features that I'm talking about. So when you sit down with your student again, you have already sort of done some of that thinking around the different books that they might be reading. So the first thing that I'm gonna kind of have us um, sit through today is um, this idea of cultivating reading identity. So um, I was kind of searching for how we can purpose and situate ourselves today um, with this talk. And one of the things that I found was this um, elementary teacher and also the stand-up comedian named Alvin Irby. And he has a really interesting talk about how readers develop identity. And I want to share this with you today. And I want you just, just to start to think about the work that you do with your student and how you're already influencing their reading identity. And then I want you to start to think strategically about how you can do some of that work with skills through questioning and discussion for them. As an elementary school teacher, um, my mom did everything she could to ensure I had good reading skills. This usually consisted of weekend reading lessons at our kitchen table while my friends played outside. My reading ability improved, but these forced reading lessons didn't exactly inspire a love of reading. High school changed everything. In 10th grade, my regular English class read short stories in its spelling test. Out of sheer boredom, I asked to be switched into another class. The next semester, I joined advanced English. <laughs> we read two novels and wrote two book reports that semester. The drastic difference and rigor between these two English classes angered me and spurred questions like, where did all these white people come from? <laughs> My high school was over 70% black and Latino, but this advanced English class had white students everywhere. This personal encounter with institutionalized racism altered my relationship with reading forever. I learned that I couldn't depend on a school, a teacher, or a curriculum to teach me what I needed to know. And more out of like rebellion than being intellectual, I decided I would no longer allow other people to dictate when and what I read. And without realizing it, I had stumbled upon a key to helping children read, identity. Instead of fixating on skills and moving students from one reading level to another, or forcing struggling readers to memorize lists of unfamiliar words, we should be asking ourselves this question. 
How can we inspire children to identify as readers? Deshaun, a brilliant first grader I taught in the Bronx, he helped me understand how identity shapes learning. One day during math, walk up to Deshaun and I say, Deshaun, you're a great mathematician. He looks at me and responds, I'm not a mathematician, <laughs> I'm a math genius. <laughs> okay, Deshaun, <laughs> right? Reading, completely different story. Mr. Irby, I can't read. I'm never gonna learn to read, he would say. I taught Deshaun to read, but there are countless black boys who, may, who remain trapped in illiteracy. According to the U.S. Department of Education, more than 85% of black male fourth graders are not proficient in reading. 85%. The more challenges to reading children face, the more culturally competent educators need to be. Moonlighting as a stand-up comedian for the past eight years I understand the importance of cultural competency, which I define as the ability to translate what you want someone else to know or be able to do into communication or experiences that they find relevant and engaging. Before going on stage, I assess an audience. Are they white? Are they Latino? Are they old, young, professional, conservative? Then I curate and modify my jokes based on what I think will generate the most laughter. While performing in a church, I could tell bar jokes, but that might not result in laughter. <laughs> As a society, we're creating reading experiences for children that are the equivalent of telling bar jokes in a church. And then we wonder why so many children don't read. Educator and philosopher Paulo Freire believed that teaching and learning should be two-way. Students shouldn't be viewed as empty buckets to be filled with facts, but as co-creators of knowledge. Cookie cutter curriculums and school policies that require students to sit statue still or to work in complete silence, these environments often exclude the individual learning needs, the interests, and the expertise of children, especially black boys. Many of the children's books promoted to black boys focus on serious topics like slavery, civil rights, and biographies. Less than 2% of teachers in the United States are black males, and a majority of black boys are raised by single mothers. There are literally young black boys who have never seen a black man reading, or never had a black man encourage him to read. What cultural factors? What social cues are present that would lead a young black boy to conclude that reading is even something he should do? This is why I created Barbershop Books. It's a literacy nonprofit that creates child-friendly <clears throat> reading spaces in barbershops. The mission is simple, to help young black boys identify as readers. Lots of black boys go to the barbershop once or <laughs> twice a month. Some see their barbers more than they see their fathers. Barbershop Books connects reading to a male-centered space and involves black men and boys' early reading experiences. This identity-based reading program uses a curated list of children's books recommended by black boys. These are the books that they actually want to read. Scholastic's 2016 Kids and Family Report found that the number one thing children look for when choosing a book is a book that will make them laugh. So if we're serious about helping black boys and other children to read when it's not required, we need to incorporate relevant male reading models into early literacy and exchange some of the children's books that adults love so much for funny, silly, or even gross books like Gross Greg. <laughs> you call them boogers. Greg calls them delicious little shifters. <laughs> that laugh, that positive reaction, or gross reaction some of you just had, black boys deserve and desperately need more of that. Dismantling the sacrifice.
savage inequalities that plague American education requires us to create reading experiences that inspire all children to say three words. I'm a reader. Thank you. I think that's powerful for a couple reasons. Number one, we know that as um, WITS volunteers working with students, you're helping shape readers' identity early, earlier than Alvin had his shape in 10th grade, right? We know that already. The next reason I think that that's really powerful is because he's talking a little bit about that idea of telling bar jokes in a church, and the same thing is true with readers with text. Specific books demand different types of questioning and discussion. And if we're always thinking about only one type of question, we're really doing a disservice to the text and we want to make sure that we're familiar enough with the text that students are reading so we can ask a variety of different types of questions so we can get a variety of different types of answers because that's going to guide student thinking and that's what's going to build student skills. And the third reason, right, is that knowing the reader and the text allows you to create a more powerful experience for your student. And that's really where that change and being able to say, I am a reader, is going to come from. So I'm gonna take you through for this first, um, probably about 15 minutes, I'm gonna take you through some just different various texts. So you have in front of you um, this sheet that I kind of compiled from a variety of different sources on the internet. Um, and I'm just gonna talk you through a little bit of the different types of books um, that students might be reading. And right now I'm also gonna ask you to do a little bit of thinking. And I'm gonna do this thing that we do um, in schools all the time with kids and with um, adults in professional development too. I'm gonna ask you to turn and talk to your someone sitting next to you at some point in time, okay? So I just wanna give you that heads up and I am gonna ask you to respond <laughs> to somebody next to you. So I'm gonna need you to do a little bit of thinking here with me, okay? So with emergent storybooks, so things like if you give a mouse a cookie, caps for sale, brown bear, brown bear. These are um, stories, one, that are memorable for kids. They're books that kids go back to. They have a character, a problem, a solution. Often they have um, a repeating refrain or phrase that kids can memorize. And so they're almost not maybe necessarily reading the words as much as they are memorizing the story, right? So brown bear, brown bear, what do you see? I see a and there's something right on the page that they can then name. So that's the idea sort of of emergent reading. It contains rich and beautiful literary language. These could also be fairy tales or folk tales, stories that kids are gonna see time and time again. The next sort of level of books that kids are gonna encounter is the <coughs> early readers. Sometimes they're broken into chapter books, sometimes they're identified from Scholastic or other organizations as like level one <coughs> books. These books um, have fewer words on the page bigger print because we know that kids' eyes develop, right, kind of later as development goes. Um, and so they're, it's larger for kids to read. And the sentence structure doesn't necessarily vary as much. So again, it might have a repetition of the same type of sentence with a picture cue that kids can look to make meaning out of the picture. Um, things like Piggy and Elephant. Oh my goodness, you know what? I'm not even using this one. Emergent storybooks, here we go. <laughs> Take a look at these. All right, so these are some different ones. You've got some different ones in front of you, too. Caps for sale, I talked a little bit about. Again, emergent storybooks. Who has um, kids that gravitate toward emergent storybooks? Just give me a wave of hand if you do. Some of us do, okay, great. Next level that we kind of talked about, this idea of early readers. So Fancy Nancy, may I, may I please have a cookie, right? These different kinds of books. Who has readers that might also gravitate toward Biscuit? Mm. Right, he's the, he gets lost every, in every book, and I don't know how, but every book he does. And Piggy and Elephant, who loves, I mean Piggy and Elephant, right, like Mo Willems does an incredible job with those two characters. Next level is going to be this idea of these easier chapter books. So, and again, I'm giving you on this sheet some different recommendations for like age level, but we know that age doesn't dictate reading, we know skills and motivation sort of dictate levels for kids. So. It's, it's kind of, it's a guide, but it might be a little bit arbitrary given the student that you're working with, right? And we know that motivation also means that kids could read at a much higher level than they might be assessed at even because they're more motivated to be trying out those different strategies. So things like the Magic Treehouse, right? These are sort of those easier chapter books 
Um, if ever you're asking about levels or your teachers are talking to you about levels, we're talking about somewhere between J, K, L, M. These types of books, these are those easier chapter books that readers might be reading. Um, again, larger font, shorter sentence structure, but a variety of sentence structure. A lot of sight words that kids might be familiar with, with many more decodable words that they're actually gonna visually track with their eyes to figure out what the decodable word might be for them. Who has kids who gravitate toward these easier chapter books or reads them with their reader? Absolutely. These books also have memorable characters and kids can start to compare and contrast the difference in the characters. So in Magic Treehouse in particular, we know that we have Jack and we have Annie. And we know there's a big difference between Jack and Annie. And in every book, right, Jack does one thing and it always kind of floats toward his character traits and Annie does the other thing where it always kind of floats toward her character traits. And that stays consistent throughout these earlier chapter books. And the same with like Mercy Watson, right? We know that she loves butter and somehow <laughs> Baby and Eugenia, right, like always have very different personalities as well. That's helping kids develop an understanding of character traits in books. And because they're staying consistent, across several books in a series, they're able to see how characters might be the same, how they might be changing, and they're able to start to do that skill of comparing and contrasting. After that, I've kind of parceled out the idea of graphic novels and comic books, and these are, these are actually two different things, though they kind of look visually very similar. Other easy chapter books, Junie B. Jones, how could I forget? <laughs> So graphic novels, the difference between graphic novels and comic books, the big difference is a graphic novel is a novel. It's gonna follow traditional plot structure, it's gonna have a character, it's gonna have a problem, it's gonna have a solution, and though there might be many books in a series, it's going to be resolved in one book. And then the next book in the graphic novel is gonna be sort of like a new storyline. Whereas a comic book, right, like Spider-Man or um, many of these different types, they're across several different issues, and the story is going to continue across several different issues. Does anybody have kids who gravitate toward comic books? Many boys, I find, right, like love to pick these up, and they love to pick up the um, graphic novels as well. And I would say, you know, if your students are choosing those books, that's motivating for them, and that's also helping to build their reader identity. And so learning how to sort of guide their thinking and discussion around those books can be really helpful for them as well. Finally, on this sheet, um, I have the idea of longer chapter books. Comic books, we've seen many of these with the Marvel and DC universe. So these longer chapter <coughs> books, um, Big Nate, so I've kind of broken this up into like, these are some for third grade, here's some for fourth and fifth. Um, these, these are books with um, characters who might be diverse learners. And then um, these books, again, they're going to follow a traditional plot structure. But the difference between um, a, a harder chapter book and an easier chapter book is going to be that students are going to have to keep track of several events across the book. And they're really going to have to start to think about determining importance of what I need to include in a summary if I'm going to tell you about this book. And it's not going to be everything. Because typically, those longer chapter books are going to be more than 150 pages. And so they're not going to be able to tell every single event that's happening in that longer chapter book. Whereas your easy reader, your earlier chapter book, it's usually less than 150 pages. And so they're gonna be able to tell you many more events and they're not gonna to have to spend as much time determining the importance of each of those events and how it really then relates to the characters or the character traits. In those longer chapter books and even I would argue in some of the uh, more complex picture books, they're really gonna to have to start to think about how characters' feelings, actions um, can dictate how they're responding to things, how characters are changing throughout books. Whereas in early chapter books, we're not seeing characters change very much. Jack is always Jack, Annie is always Annie. But in those longer ones, characters change from beginning to end. And if there's another book in the series, we might see characters even do a little bit of growth throughout the series as well. So it's just important for us to start to think about what kind of books are my readers, are my students gravitating toward why do I think that is? How do I see their identity in that book? And then the next section, we're gonna talk a little bit about how we can talk about different levels of thinking and how we can have different questions to help guide their discussion. So right now what I'm gonna ask you to do, I'm gonna stop talking for a little bit and I'm gonna ask you to do a little bit of talking. Just turn and share with somebody next to you, what kind of book does your student gravitate toward? Why do you think they gravitate toward that book? 
is there another type of book that you might like them to visit or even spend a little bit of time with? How do you think you might start to introduce that different type of text to them? Go ahead, turn and talk. Thank you so much for taking a little bit of time to share with someone near you. Um, I also like to do this other thing because I walk around and I listen to a couple ideas, which I know is a little bit of a different thing too, like, oh God, the teacher's listening to me, like I really need to be talking. Um, and I just want you to popcorn out maybe something that uh, was a new idea for you or something that you were thinking like, oh, they really gravitate toward this, but I was thinking that I would really like them to be able to do this. So help me out. Someone popcorn out an idea for me as you were talking with someone near you. Go ahead. Meg had her Spanish speaking student teach Meg the words in Spanish. Awesome. That's awesome. So having a bilingual student then teach the volunteer their native language. That's an awesome and powerful way to find identity in reading. Other ideas, let's do two more. <laughs> the other thing I heard was this idea of kind of separating out um, different graphic novels from comic books. And maybe starting to steer students toward reading more of a graphic novel and less of a comic book. Because a graphic novel, again, is going to follow that traditional plot structure, whereas your comic book isn't necessarily going to follow that traditional plot structure. And so questions that kids might get when they're being assessed or evaluated through a different reading assessment system might be, who is the character in the story? What was the problem? How did the problem get resolved? <coughs> what was the plot? And in comic books, while they're wonderful and engaging in a way for kids to find their identity and be motivated as readers, if they're into the frames in the comic book, I think you can also get them into the frames in the graphic novels. So just some things to kind of think about. The next section that we're going to kind of talk about is this idea of different levels of thinking. And we'll see if we can turn this back. There we go. Oh, I'm sorry. You know what? I missed one. These books, and I held one of them up as well, these are kind of like those more complex chapter books too. A little longer, a little more complex. They're going to ask kids to do a little bit more inferring. And so when I say inferring, I mean they're doing the thinking of what's listed in the text plus what I already know, and I'm going to come up with a new idea here. And this is also the idea of um, where you get theme from or central message, how you can take that back into your own life, how that applies to you, how does that relate to you. So those are great books too. Um, they might not always have a level, and that's okay, because they're books that kids might love to read with you. I read a page, you read a page. This word is hard, let's write down new vocabulary, that idea. And Patricia Polacco is a wonderful writer. She writes the most heartfelt stories. I would read them to yourself before you read them with a student, because they will make you cry <laughs> many times. And sometimes it's hard to not cry in front of kids. And then they're like, why are you so emotional? And you're like, how are you not so emotional? <laughs> right? So those are kind of different types of text. Um, this is a wonderful book. This is definitely a teacher book. But this is a book that I think is easy enough for anybody to use. Um, it's by Jennifer Saravello, who is quickly becoming the guru of uh, reading and writing strategies. They are ultimately the, the mecca and the bible, I would argue, for um, teaching students in small groups for many people. This is her latest. It's called Understanding Text and Readers. And it's a nice way to think about comprehension. And she's doing some really interesting research around um, how motivation influences readers' ability and comprehension in a way that we haven't necessarily thought about before. Because we know if kids are motivated to read a book, even if it's much higher than the level that we know <coughs> they can read at, using the science of how we figure out where kids are leveled at, they're suddenly able to read at a much higher level because the motivation is there. And we know that that's some of the work that you're doing too with your individual students. So if you're ever interested, this is a great resource too to check out if you're really interested in getting into um, different texts and different levels and how we think about comprehension there. So what I'm going to talk about now is just some different reading um, skills. <coughs> These are interchangeable in many ways. They are not specific to one type of text. Um, they do not all fit with all types of text. You can take one type of text and really hone in on one skill of inferring or visualizing. And you can take a different text and it's not so good for visualizing, it's not so good for inferring. So I know it's kind of small up here, I'll talk you through um, these different reading skills that readers use as the reading. So the idea of activating prior knowledge, this is huge when it comes to nonfiction. 
if you have a lot of prior knowledge about the topic that you are reading about, you are able to make many more connections to the text that you are reading. And the same is true for fiction text. So if you are able to recognize a character trait and a character is a character trait that you maybe have in yourself, again, that's background knowledge. That's something that kids can immediately relate to. Determining importance. So again, we talked about this with like that longer chapter book. The idea of determining importance is not every event in a story, not every plot point is going to be relevant for you to tell me about. Some of them are there just to move the plot along. Visualizing this idea of making a movie in your mind. Has anybody heard that before from like a teacher or a student, right? Like making a movie in your mind. This is super, super important when we have less visuals for kids. However, it's super, super important even when you do have illustrations and photographs and books because they need to also learn to read the pictures. And visualizing and teaching skills of visualization, making that movie in your mind, can help kids learn to pay attention to the pictures a little bit more because those pictures, illustrators are geniuses and they tell a story through those pictures as well. And we'll see that in the example text a little bit later too. Inferring, I've mentioned a couple times, so it's the idea of like making predictions, determining theme, how is the character feeling, what is the character trait. No book that I've read with a kid has ever said and their character trait was that they were joyful. They have to figure that out. And they do that by thinking about characters' actions, characters' feelings, what they say, how they respond to people. All of those things are literally in the text and they then have to take that literal information and use what they already know, activating their prior knowledge to come up with an inference to say, I think their character trait is their brave here, and here's why. Questioning, right? So reading with curiosity and being able to sort of say, I wonder why, and you having the ability to then ask the reader, why do you think that? That question of why can be so powerful because they might think like, well, I've never thought about that before. Right? I'm really just telling you like what's in the text. Why are you asking what I'm thinking about that? That's a new way for them to think about how their identity can then be included in the text that they're reading as well. And you can help guide some of that thinking for them. Retelling and synthesizing. So retelling is that idea of summary, right? And synthesizing is that idea of I'm gonna put all these ideas together. In nonfiction, when we talk about synthesizing, we're talking about how we determine main idea using supporting details, right? Many nonfiction books that readers are reading, it doesn't come right across and say, the main idea of this text is, it doesn't say that for them. Instead, what they have to do is they have to read those headers and then think about the different information that they're learning in the book to really determine, well, okay, this information is repeating so many times, so now I'm thinking the main idea is this, and here are some of my supporting details. This is how I know, this is why I think that. And finally, monitoring for meaning. So this idea of um, when we were talking about like skipping words, how many of you have readers who skip through words? Okay, I have like 29 in my room sometimes here, right? And they do it, and one of the things that I really wanna encourage you, and this is the hardest thing in the world as a teacher, as a parent, as a volunteer who works with students, let them blow by it. Let them just run right through it, and when you get to the end of the page, then you can say, hey, on this page, was there a word that maybe you thought was kind of tricky? Because what they're going to learn if they struggle with the word and you stop them right there, is they're gonna learn that every time I come across the word that I struggle with, I just have to look up at your face. And your whole face is gonna tell me that I missed that word or that word was tricky for me. This idea of monitoring for meaning is recognizing not only that I'm making a mistake in the words that I'm reading, or that my comprehension has broken down somewhere and I'm not making sense out of what I'm reading. And part of what I wanna encourage you to do as volunteers is let them start to monitor their own meaning. And when you get to the end of a page or the end of a section, then really ask them the question, did you miss something? Is there a word we need to go back to? What was this section about? Can you tell me? And if they can't, you wanna encourage them to actually go back and reread. Because I know myself when I take tests or when I've had to take evaluations, one of the largest skills is to go back into something and reread it. Because if we only read something once, we're not making, we're only making meaning once out of it. If we're reading it twice, we already have that prior knowledge in our mind of what it's about, so I can dig a little bit deeper into it. So monitoring for meaning, I would argue, can be one of the most crucial skills for readers 
and it's also one of the ones that we want to help them with the most. And if we learn to help them every single time they miss a word, they're going to learn every single time I miss a word, it's not my responsibility to solve it. You're going to help me. And while we want you to help them, of course, we also want them to start to be empowered as readers so that they can say, I'm a reader, I can make sense out of this, I can figure out tricky words. And I don't know about you, but sometimes when I'm reading books as an adult, there are words I don't know. And I don't sit there and, and look for anybody to help me. I don't pull out a dictionary, often, sometimes I do. But not often, right? I use context clues or I think like, what do I think it might be like? Because often when readers are reading and they come across a word they don't know, we don't need a specific definition. We just need the context of the word that they're reading within the page that they're reading it. Does that make sense? So these are different uh, reading <coughs> skills. They exist across all text. They exist across all books. And all readers will use them at some point in time. With that in mind, there are different levels of thinking. So those are skills. And these skills can exist across these different levels of thinking. So we think about levels of thinking as this idea of within the text, literally what's in there. Beyond the text, inferential, what can you really think about? And then about the text. Right, that like metacognitive, why do you think the author did that? Or how did the illustrator really make you think about blah? Okay, so I kind of tried to match for you within the text, we're thinking about determining importance, recall, retell, plot, story elements, supporting details, within the text, synthesizing and retelling. So, cause and effect, problem and solution, retelling and order, sequencing. I have readers all the time when I sit and I say, What was this text about? And they go to the last page first and they tell me the whole story backwards. Anybody else have kids that do that? I have kids, they do it all the time. Or they'll tell me it in piecemeal, right? They'll tell me the end and then they'll go to another random fact or another random fact or another random fact. And if we're really talking about readers within the text thinking about the text, we want them to be able to synthesize information to say, okay, in sequence, this was kind of the beginning, the middle, the end, that traditional plot structure that we're familiar with. Right? Rising action, the climax, falling action, the resolution, those kinds of things. Beyond the text is this idea of inferring and interpreting. So things like characters' feelings, the main idea, <coughs> unfamiliar words and context, what do they really mean? And again, beyond the text is visualizing. About the text, right? Questioning. You might be questioning author's craft. Why do you think the author made the decision? How do you think the author told you the story, right? Those are different questions than retell the story to me, or what was this story mostly about? If you're asking them to start to think about author's decisions, you're starting to get them to also think about themselves as writers, and we know the link between writing and reading is there. And that helps them then in their writing too think, okay, how can I take what I've read from this author and use their move in my writing so that I can also try that out? I'm also noticing that this author put the main idea in headers. So maybe in my writing, I'm gonna to start to use headers to say what I'm really talking about or what this text is mostly about. <clears throat> That's also about the text, this idea of activating prior knowledge around genre or content or the series, right? So the Magic Treehouse, Jack and Annie. What do you already know about Jack? What do you already know about Annie? Those ideas, right, activating the prior knowledge around like the series or even the content, what do you know about sharks? If you already know a lot about sharks, you're able then to say a lot more about what you've been reading because you're making connections to what you've already read. Okay? So these are kind of the levels of thinking. So the thing that you have in front of you, there it is. this is a depth of knowledge wheel. This is a tool that we use in teaching many times. And the reason that I like this and the reason that I printed this off for you was um, so that you could sort of see these different levels of thinking. So in each section, right, level one is this idea of recall, and you have all of these verbs that you can actually use with students. Level two, right, this skill or concept, right, of like compare and contrast, right, using context clues. You're able again to use some of this specific language <coughs> with kids so that they can start to come up to level two thinking, right? Level three is gonna be that strategic thinking, and then level four is gonna be that extended thinking, right? And you can see kind of at the bottom how that looks across different subject areas as well. This is again, just another tool for you to take with you when you work with your student. If you have students who are reading those emergent books, you're not immediately going to go to level four. 
right? You're going to start at level one. What was this about? Who are the characters in the story? What did the brown bear see? Can you tell me all of those things? Let's look back in the book. Let's look at those. What were those things that the brown bear saw? Okay. So this is, again, another tool for you to take with you as you are reading with your student, as you are questioning your student, as you are discussing with your student the different text. So these are questioning STEM examples that you could use with your students as well. So these are different things that you could say to get them to respond to you about, again, the different levels of thinking. So within the text, what were the important events in the story? What were the things the brown bear saw? Tell me all the things, and you can finish the sentence with the content, right? Beyond the text, how did the character change in the story? How did you know? That's a really powerful question for kids because it makes them really think, how do I know that? But you can't just say anything when you read a book. It needs to relate to what you're actually reading. How did the character feel the beginning versus the end? I have so many kids that tell me, oh, they were happy at the beginning, and they were happy at the end. And I'm like, did you even read the same book? Like, that is not what happened at the beginning. So and so was so upset about their loose tooth, and now here we are at the end of the story, and it's out, and she's feeling so much more joyful about that. What's the main idea in the text? How do you know? And then again, what do you think blank means? What do you think maybe one of those vocabulary words or one of those unknown words means, and how does that relate to the text? Again, we don't want a dictionary definition. That's not as useful as a kid saying, I think it's kind of like and coming up with a synonym or another word that they're able to compare that word to because that's gonna be a connection that they're gonna take with them into other books that they're gonna read or maybe they discover that word too. And then about the text, what genre is blank? Please use the word genre. I have so many kids who are like, I don't know what genre is. If they know what genre is, they're able to say it's fiction, it's nonfiction, it's historical fiction, realistic fiction, it's a mystery. Right? Different types of books. And they know them, but they might not just know that one word. How do you know again? Why do you think the author did? Have you ever, right? What do you think the central message is in this story? How does that relate to your own life? That really gets them to start to think, like, what did happen in the story? I don't know, how does that relate to my own life? So right now, again, I'm gonna stop talking for a little bit because I've just thrown a lot more information at you. And what I want you to do is I want you to start to think, what level of thinking am I going to start with my student based on the book that maybe they gravitate toward? What maybe even might be a question stem that I might ask them when we sit down to read, and then after you do a little bit of thinking and sharing with someone sitting next to you, I'm going to show you with a text how we can go through these different levels of thinking. Okay? Go ahead and turn and talk. Okay? Um, I love the conversations that I heard. I like how um, you started to think about how students are at different levels with different texts that they're reading, right? And so if they are into a book, I heard someone say that, oh, I think that they are much more able to do level three thinking versus a book that maybe they're not as into when maybe they're only down here at level two thinking. They're just not as into it. So I think that's really important to know too that Students, again, that motivation piece is huge for kids. And so their ability, right, to think deeper is then enhanced because they are more motivated by whatever is in the text that they're reading because they are gravitating much more towards it. Okay? The other note that I wanted to make about this idea of questioning stems is that you can model a think aloud for students. So instead of just posing a question for them, you can model a think aloud. You can say, so right here, I'm starting to notice that one of the events in the story is blah. And then on the next two or three pages later, you can be like, so what have you noticed about the events in the story now? And they just watched you, a proficient reader, do that thinking. And so they are much more able then to articulate their thinking because they're going to copy what you modeled for them. So this idea of you modeling a think aloud and then you posing that same idea as a question to them is gonna help them think a little bit deeper too. So I just wanna share a book that I have loved and a book that my students have loved called What Do You Do With an Idea? Has anybody read this book? Yes, okay, not very many of you. And I'm gonna try to do my best to hold this microphone. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Okay, great, thank you. Good gracious, okay. So what do you do with an idea? 
and I'm sorry, when I tried to find this in my classroom, I asked all 29 of those first graders, where's the cover? <laughs> and they were like, I think I saw it. And then I had like six of them running around the room to find it. And I was like, never mind, just it's gone, okay? We've lost the cover. And that's fine because they have loved it so much that it's probably fallen off. And I probably threw it away one day, quite frankly. This is what the cover looks like. If you haven't seen it before, what do you do with an idea? This is what the book looks like without the jacket on it. I'm going to model a little bit for you these different levels of thinking within this book. What do you do with an idea? One day, I had an idea. Where did it come from? Why is it here? I wondered, what do you do with an idea? At first, I didn't think much of it. It seemed kind of strange and fragile. I didn't know what to do with it. So I just walked away from it. I acted like it didn't belong to me. So right here, I can stop. And I can say, what do you notice about the boy's actions. <clears throat> and then I could kind of point out, like, oh my gosh, his face looks kind of sad. And I'm noticing that he's kind of like walking away from this idea. And the first thing kids are going to notice, too, is that they're going to notice, like, that idea is color, and this is in black and white. These illustrations are helping to tell a story as well. I acted like it didn't belong to me, but it followed me. I worried what others would think. What would people say about my idea? I kept it to myself. I hid it away and I didn't want to talk about it. I tried to act like everything was the same as it was before my idea showed up. But there was something magical about my idea. I had to admit I felt better and happier when it was around. It wanted food, it wanted to play. Actually, it wanted a lot of attention. It grew bigger and we became friends. I showed it to other people even though I was afraid of what they would say. I was afraid that if people saw it, they would laugh at it. I was afraid they would think it was silly. And many of them did. They said it was no good. They said it was too weird. They said it was a waste of time and that it would never become anything. And at first, I believed them. I actually thought about giving up on my idea. I almost listened to them. And so right here, I can stop again with my reader and I can say, how does the boy feel about his idea? Has he changed his mind when he shared it with other people? But then I realized, what do they really know? This is my idea, I thought. No one knows it like I do. And it's okay if it's different and weird and maybe a little crazy. I decided to protect it, to care for it. I fed it good food. I worked with it. I played with it. But most of all, I gave it my attention. My idea grew and grew, and so did my love for it. I built it a new house, one with an open roof where it could look up at the stars, a place where it could be safe to dream. I liked being with my idea. It made me feel more alive, like I could do anything. It encouraged me to think big and then to think bigger. It shared its secrets with me. It showed me how to walk on my hands because, it said, it is good to have the ability to see things differently. I couldn't imagine my life without it. Then one day, something amazing happened. My idea changed right before my very eyes. It spread its wings, took flight, and burst into the sky. <clears throat> Notice again here, those illustrations have changed. These illustrations again are telling a story that the words are not. They're making inferences based off of these illustrations. Point those out to the kids. 
I don't know how to describe it, but it went from being here to being everywhere. It wasn't just a part of me anymore. It was now a part of everything. And then I realized what you do with an idea. You change the world. And I can ask at the end of this, right? What, does, what is the message? Does this relate to your own life? How does this relate to your own life? Right? I can ask them at the end of the book that about the text, that third level of thinking. Right? And this, I love this book for many reasons, obviously, but I think it's a really nice note for us to end on because I know that you all, as volunteers and working with students one-on-one -on -one and reading, you are changing lives every single day, and that's gonna change our world entirely. Thank you for being here today. Thank you.